Hi, it's Alan, and welcome back to the Library of Alan Zandria. And so today, guys, today, so today, guys, I am excited to bring you part one of my history of the Poppy War videos. As I was taking my notes and kind of you know, making notes to, to speak from. I realized it had gotten really, really long, and this part's probably even <laughs> way too long, but I definitely needed to split it. So as you know, RF Kuang based a lot of the history um, in the Poppy War on real Chinese history and the, and the history of that region. In fact, the Poppy Wars, they're, in, they're entering the third Poppy War in the Poppy War book. And as we know, there were two Poppy Wars prior to this with the Federation of Mugen, which is analogous to our country of Japan. And so what Kuang has done is she's kind of streamlined and uh, combined and trimmed a lot of the, the late 19th, early 20th century history of China and to a lesser extent, Japan as well. And so I just wanted to kind of talk about that in case you were interested on what the history, the real history surrounding those events are. My major was in um, international politics with, a, with focusing on East Asian politics. And so I learned a lot of uh, history of Korea, Japan, and China. And so I've compiled this from uh, some of my old textbooks, um, some of the books that, that RF Kuang even recommended in her book, if you wanted to read more, as well as, you know, the internet. And so I've just kind of called all these sort Forces together to try to give you a streamlined view of what that history was like. It is by no means comprehensive, and in some places it's kind of overly simplified. So forgive me for that. This isn't supposed to be a an extended doctoral thesis on this particular subject, but I did want to kind of delve a little deeper than, than what you may already know about it. So this is not really going to have spoilers for the Poppy War. If you've watched any review about the Poppy War, you know that there is a part of the Poppy War, there's a battle that is based on the, the real-life rape of Nanking uh, by the Japanese in the Second Sino-Japanese War right at right before the dawn of World War II, and we will get to that, that is going to be reserved for part two. Part one is really going to be from the unification of China because that is echoed in the foundation of the of the country of Nikan in the Poppy War all the way up to the conclusion of the first Sino-Japanese War in 1894. And then part two is going to be from 1894 onward, including the Boxer, the Boxer Rebellion, the Empress, and all the way up to the second Sino-Japanese War, which will include the rape of Nanking. So I hope you're excited. I'm excited. I hope that you find this interesting. I think this period of history is so understudied, at least here in the West. I know there are plenty of people who, who know about this. There are plenty of places that do teach this, but I think uh, by and large, this kind of period was overshadowed by a lot of stuff that was going on in the West. And this is just really fascinating. The consequences of what happened in this period really kind of set the stage for relations between China and the West even now. China even now treats the West a certain way because of these early Western interactions in the late 19th century. So let's go ahead and get started. As I said before, the history of the Poppy War is kind of combined. It kind of combines the two opium wars with, with Britain and kind of shunts them on to, to Mugen, which is Japan. So rather than it being between China and Britain and some other Western powers, it's really between China and, it's really between Nikan and Mugen. And that kind of gets blended together with the, with the, the first Sino-Japanese war. And these, these are the poppy wars as are in the book. But let's go ahead and get started with the founding of Nikan at, by the Red Emperor. Um, in the poppy war, the Red Emperor came and he united the warring states. Nikan was separated each section having sovereignty under a warlord and all kind of like warring for the control of China at large. And so under the Red Emperor, the Red Emperor, um, he kind of conquered all of them, united Nikan and divided them into kind of 12 different tribes that were all sovereign under him as emperor. And this, there had not been an emperor beforehand. And with the Red Emperor uniting all these disparate people in the area we call China, or sorry, Nikan, 
he gave them kind of a commonality of language, a commonality of, of currency. And you're going to see this really mirrored in China's first emperor, Emperor Qin Shi Huang in 221 BC. So before he was emperor, his name was Ying Zheng, and he was the king of the Qin province that was caught up in this warring states. And when I when I first read about this, I thought, if you know anything about warring states China, you're probably thinking of three kingdoms and the Han Dynasty. And this happened really, uh, this happened several years later. It was like kind of the second warring states period. And it's probably the more popular one, at least pop culturally, if you've ever played Dynasty Warriors, right? Like I'm used to the warring states being three kingdoms and it's Wei, Shu, and uh, Wu, right? If you've, you know, and they're blue, green, and, and red respectively. But this, in real China, there were seven different warring provinces, not 12, like with the Red Emperor. So Ying Zheng conquers these seven states and he unites them, declares himself Emperor Qin, and, and while he's at it, he goes ahead and conquers Hong Kong. And we saw this with the Red Emperor when the Red Emperor conquered Spear. Now, Hong Kong and Spear are not really, I mean, they're analogous in that it's an island off the coast of China that belongs to Nikan or belongs to China. But that's really kind of where the similarities end. The Spiri, the Spiri, the Spirians, the, the Spirites, the people from Spear in the Poppy War, you know, kind of have like ties with, with that shamanism and can, can use like the firepower of the Phoenix and things like that. And that, that's, that's all invention. But so I think it's slightly analogous there. The Red Emperor conquers, uh, conquers Spear, just like Emperor Qin conquers Hong Kong and kind of brings it into the fold. So Emperor Qin, just like the Red Emperor, he eliminates this feudal system to where they're not serving the, they're not serving the kings, they're not serfs and crap, serving the kings of these provinces, and instead everyone just serves the emperor. And instead of these kind of nepotistic uh, positions, governmental positions awarded based on, based on birth, based on this nobility, this, you know, feudal system that Emperor Qin was trying to kind of like move on and give more central power to the emperor, uh, positions are based kind of on merit. And this is, uh, in the ancient world, anything based on merit is, is, I mean, pretty amazing. The ancient world is mostly, I mean, any kind of aristocracy, most things are based on, you know, your noble blood, that kind of thing. So this was, this was pretty radical for the emperor at the time. And again, this is 221 BC, guys. And so he, like the Red Emperor, he standardizes the currency. So everyone in China is kind of using the same currency. He standardizes the language so that everyone is kind of speaking the same language instead of like variations of the language, like with the Greek city-states where they all kind of spoke Greek, but uh, really did they? And he's also the first one to start construction on the wall. The, the Great Wall of China, uh, in case you weren't aware, because I wasn't before I uh, studied it, it wasn't built all at one time. It was built in pieces over a long, long, long period of time and then uh, constantly upgraded and fortified, that kind of stuff. And so he was the first one to really start building the Great Wall. Now, Emperor Qin was... was massively powerful and he wanted to be powerful in the afterlife as well and so when he was buried he was buried with hundreds of terracotta warriors and if you've ever seen the terracotta army I'm showing a picture here right now. If you've ever seen the Terracotta Army, this is Emperor Qin. You can still go see that if you go to China today. Um, and I've never been, but my buddy Finn has been. He lived over in China. And, and he says it's freaking awesome. So he's buried with the Terracotta Warriors. And, and the Qin Dynasty eventually gives way to the Han Dynasty, which is that Warring States period that we're probably a little more familiar with. And so that is the Red Emperor. So now we're going to flash forward ahead to the... Opium Wars, which is really one of the two wars that the Poppy Wars are in fact based off of. And so we're going to pick back up here in the, the late 18th century with the Qing Dynasty. So the first Opium War took place between 1840 and 1842, and it was, as it's named, primarily over the freaking opium trade. So opium had been used medicinally by China for centuries, like the, the poppy, you know, the poppy plant 
as opium had been used medicinally forever. And meanwhile, the British, who, you know, at this point were colonizing freaking everything, really, the British really, really loved tea and silk from China. Like, they could not get enough of that freaking tea and silk. Like, over there, give us the tea. Give us, that's not British enough. Uh, uh, Spitzbot, oh, could we please have the tea? Thank you. And the silk, yes, uh, that also. Spitzbot, uh, cool, blimey, uh, and all that good stuff. <laughs> please, more, more silk, more tea. Uh, just load up the ships, please load up the ships. Here's some silver, here's some silver. So it's like that over and over and over again. And because of the demand back in England for that tea, for that silk, for tea especially, Britain was importing from China way more than they were exporting into China. So there was this massive trade deficit between, between Britain and China. And it made it worse with the fact that China would only accept payment from foreign powers in the form of silver. So there's no like credit, there's no like, there's no like notes, there's no like other metals. Silver. You are paying in silver what they're called tails, silver tails, which I think is just, I think a tail, T-A-E-L, is like a weight of silver. So they would only accept that from the British. So the problem is that the British are just pouring money into China to get that sweet, sweet Chinese tea, y'all. Problem is, right here at the turn of the 18th century, what is Britain also embroiled in? The frickin' Revolutionary War. Thanks, Hamilton. The world turned upside down. So because of that, they're having to funnel cash and funnel silver over to, to the war effort. They're having to make more coins. They're having to pay for other stuff for the war. And so this China thing is not really working for them. It's depleting their coin supply. But things aren't all great on the Chinese side either. Because of all of the silver influxing into China, China's economy is has become exceedingly reliant on British silver, where if it was kind of removed, the economy would whoa, 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 like topple or like at least stagger because it's being propped up by all that British silver. Now, Britain had already kind of taken over um, it taken over the in India area and had colonies in India, and it was using its Indian colonies to kind of grow its own opium. Um, the Richard Sharp books by Bernard Cornwell, the first few books of that deal with kind of Britain's putting down rebellion over in its Indian colonies. And so Britain had a law that all opium had to be funneled, all opium, even if it's not government grown, even if it's, it, no matter who's growing it, all opium is sold through the East India Trading Company. And if you don't know the East India Trading Company, watch any of the Pirates of the Caribbean besides the first one. Two, three, two and three, yeah, two and three, maybe four, I can't remember. Piece of eight. We wish for you to act as our agent in a business transaction with our mutual friend, Captain Sparrow. Uh, did, has anybody even seen four and five? I saw four. I'm not sure I saw five. Anyway, East India Trading Company, that's like Britain's like government trading company. It just sounds so innocuous and yet, <laughs> and yet. So all of these opium farmers, they sell, their, they sell their drugs to the East India Trading Company, which then becomes the peddler of narcotics or opioids, I guess. And Britain has a plan. Oh, hmm. Perhaps we can get some of that silver back if we just start funneling this, uh, these opioids into China. And they'll want to buy it and they'll pay us with silver and we'll start making some of those sweet pounds sterling back. <laughs> I do believe so. And then we'll all dance around and be British and drink our tea on our silk rugs. And that's exactly what they do. The British start flooding China with their Indian grown opium. And soon the Brits are starting to make back that silver they've been funneling into the Chinese economy. <laughs> but at the cost of, China is now filled with drugs. So if you haven't spotted the problem, here it is. So not only is China losing some of that silver, but with massive quantities of opium flooding the country, they are suffering a widespread addiction to opium. And opium addiction, and it's all along the eastern part of the country, which is where which is where the British were kind of allowed to trade on that eastern uh, eastern seaboard, like right there with Shanghai and Canton, Cant Canton and uh, Guangzhou, which we'll talk about in a second. So from like the east moving west, it just becomes a land of zombies because opium addiction is classless. The, the lower classes 
use the opium. The aristocrats, the nobles, they use the opium. And it just creates these just brain, these just brainless zombies that are just addicted to this drug. And we see that in the poppy war, that same kind of thing. So in the poppy war, it's it's said that, that the, the Federation of Mugen, Japan, was, was kind of flooding Nikon with opium on purpose in order to create this kind of opium addicted society. And, you know, maybe the British, maybe the British were doing that as well. I don't know. All I know is that they were definitely concerned about getting some of their silver back. So that's why they're just pumping it like opium, opium, opium. And so this becomes really a national crisis for China. And so in 1796, in 1796, the emperor says, no more, no opium, banning it. You can't sell opium in here. You dirty Brits, get out get out. You can keep selling your stuff. We'll keep selling you tea. We'll keep selling you silk. You can no longer sell opium in China. Stop it. Stop it. Because this wasn't illegal up to this point. This was part of British trade. Guys, I hope this is, I hope this is even remotely interesting for you. I realize I've been talking for a really long time and I'm literally talking about international trade. <laughs> I think this stuff is super interesting and I hope that you that you think it's interesting too. So this ban on opium is really the start of the souring uh, of relations between China and Britain that's gonna lead us to that opium war in 1840. So all foreign goods, any, China is not open to the public. It's not, not open to the public. Westerners are allowed to trade, but only at the sole port of, of what, what we know as uh, Canton, um, or Guangzhou in, in Chinese. And with every single foreign goods coming through this one port, um, goods could be really easily inspected because, y I mean, you just funnel your inspectors right there and they can just inspect every ship trying to trade. Now, th this port was run by these, these, uh, these trading families, these guys that were high up that were kind of like Chinese trading houses run by, I forget how many there were, but they're called the Hongs. And so the Hongs were in charge of inspecting inspecting the cargo and making sure that nothing illegal came into China. Well, the British, as you know, guys, the British are the most powerful empire in the world at this time, and they certainly don't give a crap about what they see as like lesser nations, uh, less civilized nations, because remember, they're like, you know, they've had their industrial revolution and everything's like, they have advanced technology, and they're certainly not gonna be told what to do by freaking China, right? So the Brits, they don't listen to China because you know, they're the freaking British Empire. And so they subvert the emperor's ban on opium by just taking it to the black market. Because as long as there's been illegal trade, there's always been a black market. So they convert the ships, like the British ships that aren't really uh, that good for war anymore, like decommissioned warships. They convert those into like floating opium warehouses. So off the coast of China, there's these floating crappy ships just loaded down with drugs. And so it's easy to kind of make these drug deals with the drug dealers in China, the, the smugglers, they take their little boats out to meet the floating, the floating drug fortress. And then those smugglers would just take it anywhere because Chinese ships can dock anywhere. It's only the foreign ships that have to dock at Canton, right? So they, they load up, give me the drugs, give me the drugs. Come on, got to re-up, got to re-up. And then they'll just sail somewhere else and get it through where it's much easier to pass inspection. Now, if the, if the Chinese government or the Hongs ever try to like pursue them, the British, the British Navy's just, it's just better. It's faster. And so it's easy to outrun any Chinese ship that tries to like take down one of the, one of the, the drug boats. And so the British are just like, cool, we're going to keep flooding it with opium. We're going to keep getting that money and we're going to, you know, keep got to feed our tea habit. So things get even worse for the Chinese because the Americans are seeing just like the massive amount of profit that the British are making on the opium trade. And so the Americans have decided that they're going to get in on the action. But American grown opium is like garbage. It's like, it's just, it's crap drugs. Uh, I can't not make comparisons to The Wire. It's like that. I don't know if you've seen The Wire where in the one seasons there's like the crappy drug. I don't know. Whatever. The Americans have the crappy opium. But the fact that they have opium at all is driving down the prices of opium. So the Brits are like, we've got this really quality, these quality drugs that we can't unload for the price that it's worth because the Americans are driving down the price. So the problem for China is that this price war, if, welcome to economics class, ladies and gentlemen, oh, supply and demand curve, change in supply, change in demand. Anyway, 
Opium's dirt cheap now, and when drugs are dirt cheap, more people can afford them. So even more people are becoming addicted to opium in China. <laughs> and it gets even worse. With all this opium buying because it's cheap, all of a sudden there's a supply shortage because so there's so much opium being sold, supply can't keep up with the demand. So now even more European nations just start piling on the opium trade. So now everybody in the freaking West is in on the drug sales. And so even more opium starts flooding into China. Compiling even further, guys, this is a confluence of events. Compiling even further, because China was losing so much British silver to the opium trade, in order to kind of recoup some of that that lost revenue, they started raise, raising taxes on any imports. And when taxes are raised or the goods coming in through Canton, well now the Hongs, their take, the guys in charge of running the port, their take of kind of like the percentage of goods that they're bringing in through that port, now it's lowered. And when their take is lowered, when they're all of a sudden making less cash, well what happens then? susceptible to bribes, start greasing the palms. The British are like, oh, I've got uh, four guineas here. <laughs> it says that this ship is filled with beanie babies. <laughs> and they're like, ah, oh, yes, they're beanie babies. Please have them go on through. And the Americans are like, yeah, right here. I just, uh, this is just, this is a delivery. I'm from DoorDash right here. I'm just trying to deliver this bucket of fried chicken to, uh, uh, to I don't know, someone, some random person. And I got, uh, I got me uh, an Abraham Lincoln right here that, uh, that says you ain't seen nothing. And they're like, oh, I'll take that Abraham Lincoln, even though it's definitely like 60 years away before he's ever even president. So it's just like that. So their, their palms get greased and they're, they're more susceptible to bribes. And when they are not stopping the illegal contraband, even more opium floods into China. Ugh, poor China, like seriously, poor China is just being kind of just kind of ruined by the, these Westerners. And so the end result is this is turning a, a, a giant, giant percentage of the Chinese population into drug addled zombies. So despite, despite the emperor's ban on opium, this black market trade kind of goes on for another 40 years. And it's not until 1839, the imperial commissioner, the kind of guy in charge of the finances of the empire, Lin Zexu writes to Queen Victoria herself and demands that she put a stop to the frickin' opium trade that is ruining the country. So Lin waits for a response and when he gets nothing, he takes matters into his own hands. And so Commissioner Lin summons all 12 of the Hongs, the guys in charge of all of the foreign trade coming into Canton, he summons them all together in one place and he calls them out for traitors because of their corruption, because of all of the bribes they're taking and all the opium they're freaking letting into the country. And he gives them three days, gives them an ultimatum. He says, you got three days, three days to confiscate all of the opium from the foreigners, confiscate every bit that they've got in those ships. If you do not, he is gonna randomly choose two of you. Two of the Hongs are gonna randomly be chosen, they're gonna be executed, and the government's gonna take their land. So the Hongs are like, holy crap, like, they don't know who it's gonna be, they don't want it to be them, and so they kind of agree, and they approach the foreigners like, hey, um, we're gonna have to confiscate all this crap, Let's not make this a bigger deal than it needs to be. So now we get to kind of the mediation intermediary place where everything just goes so wrong. So, so wrong. So the British superintendent of trade, the guy in charge of British trade, Charles Elliott, he convinces the British to give over. He's like, look, let's avoid conflict with the Chinese. We need to keep our port here. We need that tea, need that silk. He convinces them, the British merchants, to just let their opium be confiscated. And this comes up out to 1,300 tons. Tons! That's what, 26,000 pounds of opium. And that's worth up to, that's worth about 2 million pounds. Uh, pounds, not weight, pounds, British money. 2 million monies is what it is worth that these British merchants have lost. And they're ticked off. In fact, the only way Elliot gets them to agree is that he says, look, just do it now. The British government, the crown and, and the government are going to reimburse you that lost cost for the opium that you're getting rid of. So don't worry. Plus, you'll be compensated a little extra for your trouble, inconvenience fee. Guys, we got to keep peace with the 
Chinese. Come on, stiff up a lip. Uh, do it for the queen, for queen and country, you know. So then, guys, the Chinese destroys all that opium. They put it on a beach and they set it on fire and it burns for days. It burns for days. It runs off from the beach into the water. Like it's this huge deal. The Brits can see the smoke, the pyre of their just burned opium from their freaking boats. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 And I mean, <laughs> It's kind of like a twisting of the knife for the Brits to just see the conflagration of this opium that they they bought from the people who grew it. They grew the opium, they bought it fair and square, they're trying to turn a profit, confiscated by Commissioner Len and just set on fire. Because Commissioner Len, is, he is a hard-nosed guy. He's not, he's done. He's done with the opium addiction in the country. So. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot and the um, and the British merchants start writing letters to Parliament saying, uh, "Excuse me, uh, we gave all of our opium to the Chinese, which they then proceeded to burn in front of us, and we have not seen a brass farthing in repayment. We are wondering when you are planning on sending us all of the reimbursement for that money that we uh, just threw, essentially threw into the fire to keep uh, loyalties with the Chinese." And Parliament is like. Uh, look, bro. <laughs> that's not British at all. Uh, look, bro. That's, that, that sounds... Uh, we're very sorry. Uh, there must have been some misunderstanding, some confusion. Uh, we never actually said that we were going to do that. We don't know where Elliot got that idea. We're definitely not going to pay you back. That is too much money. We have too many other things going on. Sorry you lost your opium. Unfortunate. Uh, just go buy some more. Uh, we are very sorry. <laughs> uh, we, we, we see how that could be an inconvenience to you. But no, we're, we're not going to pay you back for that. I, we, I don't know where Charles got that. And we don't know if Elliot misheard or if he was making it out. Like, we don't know. <laughs> but the Parliament's like, we don't know if, 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 if they did promise that and then they're just like, oh, whoa, uh, hold on there, boys. But they say that they're not going to pay these merchants back. So the Brit, the British merchants are ticked, but business has to go on, right? And so that regular, regular legal trade carries on, but relations are really bad between the British and the Chinese at this point. So it's at this point the two drunken British soldiers beat beat a Chinese villager to death, uh, just because relations are really bad between the between the British and the Chinese right now and they're drunk and they decide to take it out on a villager and they beat him to death. Commissioner Lin demands that the British hand these soldiers over to the Chinese to be tried with China because it was a Chinese citizen that was killed. Well, if you know anything about <laughs> just anything about relations with Britain and anybody and foreign powers and all this stuff, there's no way. Britain's like, no, like, we're not going to do that. We're going to try them ourselves. They, they promise they'll bring justice. Oh, of course they will. Sure you will, Britain. Right? Well, when that happens, China says, Commissioner Lin's like, cool, guess what? No food, no water to the British. No one in China sells anything to the British. No food, no water. Where are you going to get your supplies, Britain? Because we were selling you a lot of food and water now. Where are you going to get that for your sailors? Sail away. Sail away, sail away, sail away. So when they can't buy any food or water in Canton, the British, ever resourceful, try to kind of sneak into some other harbors around China to buy this these freaking necessary supplies. And they end up going near a town called Kowloon and they run into like a small group of Chinese ships. And here are the first hostilities in this precursor to the first Opium War. There's this small skirmish called the Battle of Kowloon and the British, I mean, the British really do uh, the British wreck the Chinese ships. Their, their navy is just superior. Um, and it, it's only like one ship sinks, I think. And it's just, I mean, it's just a bad, like, kind of diplomatic relation thing. There's not a lot of deaths, but there is military action that takes place over uh, Commissioner Lin's embargo of food and water being sold to the British. So, back to England. The lobbyists, oh, it's good to know that in, 18, in the 1840s, there were lobbyists. Yay! So lobbyists back in England for these merchants, these merchant companies that had their opium confiscated and burned, they start putting pressure on Parliament, being like, um, uh, pay us back, pay us back, pay us back, please, pay us back, please, pay us, pay us, pay us. And they start like, they start funding, uh, 
the other parties in parliament. And so a pro-war, a pro-war, an anti-Chinese majority kind of takes over parliament. And when that happens, they send demands to China like you do. And guys, these demands could not be more British. They could not embody the monstrous arrogance of the British Empire if they tried. So one of the first points, it's not pay us back. Oh, pay us back is there. It's you need to show us the proper respect that is due an empire like us. Uh, we demand to be treated with respect. Then it's we demand you pay back the money with interest of, worth of the opium that you burned. Also, you're going to give us favored trading status. We still have that kind of stuff today, favored trading status, where essentially they, the best deal on any trade has to be with this nation. Like, you can't give anybody else kind of a better deal. So we want, we want favored trade status. So we're going to be a favored trade nation. You're going to respect us. You're going to pay us back for the crap that you set on fire. And then, and then you're going to open more ports in China because we're tired of going through crappy Canton. So you're you're gonna do this or else <sighs> okay Britain okay and so this there there is no benefit f f uh, to China from this none it is really just a way to open China up remember China isn't open it's just got that little funnel they want to open China up so they can really kind of just kind of dominate trade in China and the favored trade status will let them dominate well above like the, uh, the the Dutch and the and the Americans and the Russians. So when China does not comply, hostilities begin and the opium war starts. Now you see it is almost entirely due to that freaking opium trade. And so there are a bunch of battles I'm not going to get into. If you're interested in that, please go go read about that. There's lots of really cool like military action, but Nobody has that kind of time. I've already run really I've already run so much longer than I thought I was going to run with just the first opium war. And so the the hostilities go on for two years until they are finally settled in Nanking, which is the the, the which is the capital currently. It's not it's not Peking or Beijing yet. Um, and it ends with the Treaty of Nanking in 1842. The British this ends because the Chinese really kind of surrender. The British won. The British won this war. And so they are able to kind of force China into an unfavorable treaty. The Treaty of Canton, one, opens more ports than Canton, which is what the British had demanded to start with. China has to pay 21 million pounds in both war reparations and for the destroyed opium. Remember, the destroyed opium was only worth about 2 million pounds. So, <laughs> and it's really interesting when, when, when my buddy Finley and I, who is also really up on, on Chinese history, were, were kind of discussing this, I was kind of hashing it out with him. He, he didn't know if China had ever actually paid uh, the British that 20 million pounds. And we looked it up and we can't really find out if China ever like made good on that debt, but there it is. And then the third conceit that China has to make is it cedes the island of Hong Kong to Britain. And if you were, you know, a 90s or an 80s kid like 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 I was, you know that the British the British had a lease on Hong Kong for 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 99 years and it was in the 90s that they had to give it back to China. Um, there's a really excellent historical fiction book by James Clavell called Taipan that is about the British trading companies on Hong Kong that trade with the Hongs and and everybody in um, in China, and it's so fascinating, just the competition between the trading houses. It's an excellent, excellent historical fiction novel if you haven't read it. And so the Treaty of Nanking in 1842 was the first of what China calls the unequal treaties and ushered in what they called the century of humiliation. And guys, as I talk about this, you're gonna see China, it just gets, it is gets the short end of the stick uh, in respect to both the freaking West and Japan, which we're go I'm going to end up having to talk about next time. What's really interesting about this is that China, China's relations with the West has its roots in this these unequal treaties. Unlike some of these Western nations, like okay, just look at America and Japan. We end World War II, Japan is the bad guy, and all of a sudden in the 50s, we reconstructed Japan's our best buddy, right? Like, let's do what's good for business, forget about all those, that animosity. China remembers. 
China remembers. There was a there was an episode of 24. Um, the Chinese were the bad guys, one of the seasons of 24. But the guy, I forget what his name was, Zhao, I think it was, he said, did you think we would forget, Mr. Bauer? The Chinese have very long memories. You surely must be aware, Mr. Bauer, that China has a long memory. And that's, that's what this is. A lot of China's distaste of the West and mistrust of the West is because of these unequal treaties that really took advantage of a less technologically advanced China. And I think that's so interesting. I hope you're finding any of this interesting in any way. So what was amazing about the Opium War, the first Opium War, is that the British, the British only had 19,000 soldiers. And with that 19,000, they had defeated a much, much larger army of 200,000. The Chinese fielded 200,000 soldiers versus the British 19,000. And yet the British came out on top. And it's because it is because the British were westernized because they were the West. China had not yet modernized. It hadn't gone through its industrial revolution. Uh, Britain had Britain had superior technology, it had superior tactics, it had superior discipline, it had superior navy, which I've already talked about. Um, it had also had just finished these wars in India where it had won a bunch of wars against a much more populous peoples who were less technologically advanced. So they, they've already won wars where they were vastly outnumbered, but their tactics and their technology uh, was able to beat these uh, these kind of less technologically advanced forces. And so the British were used to this. They had just come off of India and China, China had no idea what to expect with the British here. Their tech, their technology, their tactics, and especially their Navy couldn't even, it couldn't hold a candle to the British. It just couldn't. Like China did what China could do, but they just weren't a match for the might of the British empire. But it should also be said that China, and you're gonna see this even more, China, you have to understand the pride of China. For 3,000 years, China had dominated this region. China had just been the superpower in the East. China could not accept that these, these Europeans, these, these foreigners, were superior to them. There was so much pride in being Chinese and being like kind of the leaders of the world as they knew it. So even when the British start winning, they, they just couldn't accept that they were inferior in any way to the British. And so that, that pride and that, those misconceptions about, oh, you know, the pansy Westerners, it really prevented them from being able to, to adapt to the changing circumstances, to adapt to this kind of unexpected way of fighting that the British brought. So let's talk about the Second Opium War, which is also kind of rolled into to the Poppy War. The Second Opium War takes place in 1856. And like I said, China cannot catch a break. So first Opium War ends in 1842. They have this unequal treaty with the British. Almost as soon as that's over, the entire Chinese countryside just erupts into the, the Taiping Rebellion. And guys, the Taiping Rebellion itself is just one of these bizarre stories of history that you're like, no, 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 you're making that up, right? Like there's so many of these in actual history, but this is real crap, guys. This stuff is real, but it's just so, like, you're like, no way. So the Taiping Rebellion began when a peasant named Hong Shu Quan had visions of himself as the brother of Jesus Christ. I need you to understand that this Chinese peasant, Hong Shu Quan, thought of himself as the reincarnation of the brother of Jesus. This is true. And so he starts this peasant rebellion that attempts to overthrow the Chinese government and establish this kind of like bizarre, corrupted Christianity, like converts, he wants to convert the whole country into Christianity, but it's not like, it's not like regular Christianity. It's like weird, like it's weird Hong Shu Kwan Christianity, brother of Jesus Christianity. But guys, the Taiping Rebellion, China can't even think about dealing with the British. They can't think about dealing with, with the Westerners because the government is trying so hard to put down this rebellion. It lasts for 14 years. It takes 14 years to end this rebellion and it kills millions of Chinese. 30 million Chinese are killed in this 14 year conflict. And that, guys, this, this doesn't even have anything to do with the British. And it's, it's still fascinating. It's absolutely like, what? A Chinese Jesus brother? 
starts a peasant rebellion that doesn't get put down for 14 years by the massive Chinese government? 30 million people die? What? Guys, 30 million is so many people. So many. Chinese morale is at an all-time all low. Opium addiction, natural disasters. They have earthquakes and famines. Uh, there's the loss to the British, like mistreatment by the West. Problems with the economy. All of this has just really, like, Chinese morale all-time low, guys. So, uh, n the British were had really kind of a lock on trade in China for a while. But now the Americans and the French have really kind of established a really a pretty strong foothold in the Chinese trade. And their kind of trade deals have kind of expired. And so France and America are renegotiating uh, their treaties with China. And it, China is uh, granting them most favored nation status. And Britain's like, uh, ha, 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 hang on a minute. <laughs> we are the most favored nation, if I seem to recall, from the Treaty of Nanking. Just like they're renegotiating with the French and the Americans, they demand equal, they demand equal renegotiation. They're like, we're going to talk about the Treaty of Nanking and get a few other things since you're so, you're so cozy with the Americans and ugh, the French. And they're like, what is your problem? We are here in China. We are also selling tea things. We are buying tea and silk. And the Americans are like, yeah, all right, go America. So among the demands, among the demands made by the British in the renegotiation of the Treaty of Nanking is they're like, okay, you open some more ports. Here's what you're going to do. All ports are open. We can trade anywhere with whoever we want in China. Open all of China to British trade. And, and if, if it wasn't clear in the Treaty of Nanking, he, opium is still illegal. Opium was never legalized, so the opium trade is still not allowed, despite the treaty. Now the British say, you're going to legalize the opium trade, because it's all about the almighty pound. If you've ever seen 1776, shall we dance to the sound of the profitable pound? Shall we dance to the sound of the profitable pound? And that's what they want. They want the legalization of the opium trade and let us let them trade with anybody in, with any port in China. And so China's like, no. Like, no, we're not gonna do that. And so they seize a British, a British ship called the Arrow um, on suspicion of, uh, of piracy. They think that uh, the ship is one, smuggling opium, two, preying on Chinese or other, other trading vessels as well. And so the Chinese, they haul that vessel in. Now, the ship was crewed by Chinese sailors that were being paid by the British. They were Chinese in the British employ. And the Chinese, they haul the, they haul the ship in and they, they run the, the, the English flag down and they, you know, talk it off the ship because guess what it belongs to the Chinese now and the British demand they demand from the Chinese government they say you're gonna give it you're going to give us back our, uh, our, our sailors they belong to they, sorry they're in our employ not yours please give them back and they demand that the Chinese apologize for the disrespect they did to the British flag what guys that is so arrogant so monstrously arrogant. And so China, China gives back nine of their prisoners, but they're like, we don't give a crap about your stupid, like you and your crappy, your, your, your flag. They don't care about the flag at all. They don't care about them or their crappy steakhouse. They're, they're like, no, we're not apologizing for, for mistreating your flag, Britain. Because of this, the seizing of this vessel and the not returning all the, all the sailors and the disrespect of the British flag, the British partner with the French. Imagine how angry they have to be to be partnering with the French and they lay siege to Canton. Now the French are in this because one of the French missionaries were killed um, by the Chinese in China for some reason. So the French are like, we will assist you and we will take over Canton. And so that siege of Canton sparks the second opium war, which lasts four years until 1860. Once again, the large Chinese army, it's as if they didn't learn anything. Part of it is because they're low on supplies and morale and, uh, you know, really forces just having been beaten down by the Taiping Rebellion. And part of it is the Chinese just won't adapt. They won't adapt. They can't accept that they're losing to Westerners. They just can't deal with it, guys. So this time, during, during this war, the British actually, they burn down the Emperor's Summer Palace. That's like his summer home. They just set it ablaze. Now, this is ostensibly because the Chinese executed 20 British prisoners rather than giving them back to the British. Uh, 
uh, ostensibly. Maybe they were just looking for a reason to set fire to the Summer Palace to say, hey, Emperor, we are serious business. You need to cut it out. So the Emperor fled north. The Emperor fled north, fled away from, uh, away from the British, and the British kind of have, ne they negotiate with the government that's left, and they negotiate as the victors, guys. In 1856, yet another unequal treaty is forced upon the Chinese. They meet at Beijing and, uh, and they form and they agree on this treaty, which is even less favorable terms than Nanking. So with the Treaty of Nanking, uh, China had been ceded Hong Kong. Well, now that whole Kowloon Peninsula, the whole peninsula right across from Hong Kong, that is ceded to the British now as well. So it's now British territory. They also demand freedom of religion in China. So now the British and the, uh, the Protestants and the Christians can freely evangelize in China without being, uh, without being arrested or killed. British can now carry indentured Chinese servants to America. Ah, forced involuntary labor. <sighs> In addition, China has to pay 8 million tails, which is like weight of silver, to both uh, Britain and France. And again, I don't know if they ever actually paid up on that debt that they owe, but this is the second freaking unequal treaty in 20 years that the Chinese have been subjected to by the freaking British. And then the last thing, the thing that just kind of is just insult to injury, opium is legalized. And so now the British can come and go and opium can just keep flooding China and then keep making that sweet, sweet money. And so in the Poppy War, in the Poppy War, there was the, the, the war over opium and opium kind of taking over the country and it becoming a problem and the emperor declaring it illegal. But it wasn't the British who were supplying it in the book. It's the Federation of Mugen, the, the Japanese. Um, and that's gonna kind of be combined with the first sign Sino-Japanese War. Guys, I have been talking, I only got through the, the two opium wars and I'm already way, 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 way over time. So this will obviously be more than two parts. The next time I come back, we will, I'm going to go and we're going to visit the Japanese and figure out because, because Nanking was just a culmination of so many things, both with, with Chinese identity and the Japanese identity and a lot to do with how they felt about the West. We can't really understand how something as abominable as Nanking happened without understanding both China and Japan. So next time, we're going to kind of talk about how Japan kind of got to where they are and how they ran afoul of China and what began the first Sino-Japanese War. Guys, I hope you found this interesting. If you did, please let me know in the comments that you enjoyed this. Um, if not, that's fine. I mean, it's cool. It's not for everybody. Um, I really like this stuff. I think it's fascinating. I hope you found at least part of it interesting. I'll be back with more pretty soon. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want to support me additionally, feel free to join the Patreon. If you don't want to do that, um, come join the Discord and uh, engage us in conversation. We have a grand old time. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you next time.